you very much. There we are. Um, I, I hope that uh, no one um, has come to this uh, conversation this evening expecting to see Jen Selfridge. I'm a poor stand-in for, for Jen. She, uh, uh, some of you may even remember her from her uh, maiden name of Jen Fry, um, who is uh, just leaving the Department of Natural Resources after just decades of work on rare and endangered butterflies and other uh, fauna. We're gonna miss her a lot. Um, but because she was transitioning, she asked if I could possibly step in because I've been involved with a lot of the work that she's done. I work with Dick Smith a lot. Many of you know that uh, for the last uh, five or six years of the um, regular updates that Dick did, we did them on Leplog, and I was the person who was doing all that with him. And I see a lot of folks uh, here on the on the uh, chat tonight that I know, and some of my posse's when we go out in the field at the Green Ridge uh, uh, State Forest surveys and elsewhere. And I just have to say, to, to preface all this. You know, the kind of work that we do and the kind of things you're going to be seeing here tonight really depend on a whole community of people helping out. And I hope that with this conversation this evening, there will be more of you in that community helping us figure out what the status of many of the butterflies uh, and the conservation status is right here in the evening. I'm going to share my screen. So let me just uh, pop that up and make sure everybody can see that. So is everyone seeing now the title slide? That should, should be what's up there. And Looks if for good. some reason, excellent, Fred, thank you. Um, if for some reason you can't follow it here, you can check that link that's in the chat and the, the same slides will be there in a PDF form. If you've gone to that link already and you see that there are 108 slides, deep breath, I'm not going to do all those slides tonight. We're going to mostly look at the uh, things we know are already extirpated things that are S1 and S2, and then some things that are on the horizon. And then there are a lot of things in the S3 category that we probably won't have a chance to talk with tonight. But at any point, I won't be able to see the, while I'm sharing the screen, I won't be able to see the chat. So if you have questions, interrupt me, that's not a problem. Fred, if you see something in the chat while I'm uh, going through and someone has a question, let me know and we'll take those questions from the chat as well. So my own background is science writing. A lot of you may remember me actually from my um, uh, career as a graduate student at the University of Maryland, where I was studying insect plant interactions, mostly among leaf mining moths, the tissue reeds. Um, but I finally realized that I much preferred talking about and writing about uh, insects than I did actually working with them in the lab or working with them in the field. I like to do them all. But that's why you find me now as a communications director for one of the big federal science agencies um, doing butterflies and birds and botany on the side. And that leads me to a lot of the work that I do with the Maryland Butterflies of Conservation Concern. So just as an overview, what, what we're looking at is a list that's really been developed a number of years ago now, and we're due to take a look at this list and figure out what's still relevant, what's whether the status of any of these have changed. Sadly, the statuses that we know have changed have been mostly for the worst. And there are currently about 42 species warranting some kind of conservation status as ranked by the Department of Natural Resources. Uh, and you can read that in this uh, uh, in their current list of rare, threatened, endangered animals of Maryland, uh, which is a really comprehensive uh, conversation primarily around the butterflies we know the status of. There are a lot of butterflies we don't really know the status of particularly well. So I just want to observe here at the beginning that the DNR rankings reflect only what are believed to be permanent residents, breeding species here in the Maryland butterfly fauna. So for example, you won't see seasonal migrants like uh, Brazilian skipper, which often will get a little uh, subpopulations of in July and August and September, and they're wiped out as soon as the frost comes along. Typically, they hitchhike up from uh, stock coming up from Florida. Sometimes they actually make it here on their own as a consequence of uh, prevailing southwest or southeasterly winds. And sometimes we'll see them, you know, popping up and coming up with folks who bring their own can of cuttings. Turns out that uh, we haven't seen as much of Brazilian skippers in the last couple of years. We had a big a couple of eruptions two or three years ago before COVID because there was not as much uh, traffic in cannas that were brought up and 
for those of you who know cannas, you know that most of the time you buy them as tubers. Well, the skippers can't survive on the tubers, but when you put them in a pot and ship the whole pot up here, you often ship uh, Brazilian skippers along with them. They're also known as uh, canna skippers. Little yellow is something that often uh, in years past would establish summer colonies here, but could not survive the winter. Dainty sulfur is another one that we often have. So these, these, uh, um, these little populations of wing cow. None of those are going to be contained in these DNR rankings because they're not considered species are, that are going to be here um, as a as a breeding um, uh, as a breeding species most of the time. <clears throat> so, just as in the way of an overview of what we're going to look at tonight among these forty two species, it's heavily weighted toward Lycaenids and skippers. So a lot of the gossamer wings, the particularly hair streaks, people are just completely obsessed with the hair streaks. And skippers, for whatever reason, have a real special place in people's minds as well. Um, and so you'll see a lot of the focus here on Lycaenids and skippers, because that's frankly where a lot of the work has also been done on the taxonomy. Many of the species, if not most of them we're we'll talking about tonight, are univolting species, and that puts them at special risk because anything that happens to their one flight during the year, they don't have another flight or two to recover in, in a given year. And so if you have, for example, spongy moth spraying in an area where you have a univoltine species and it wipes them out, it really does wipe them out. There's no chance for them to recover. Now, for a lot of these species, I have to say, and this is, this is what bedevils the creation of lists like this, is that it's probably as much a reflection of observer effort as it is actual abundance. And we'll talk about a couple of species where that's particularly uh, uh, the case, I think, here going forward. Observation data typically, in fact, favor large, colorful, charismatic species. Uh, so you'll see a lot of that. That's really compounded by our increasing use and reliance on photo documentation sites like iNaturalist, Maryland Biodiversity Project, and others where, yes, you can put non-vouchered and non-photographed specimens, not documented specimens or non-documented sightings, but you really don't get the full benefit of the site and you're sort of shunted off to the side if you don't have a photo documentation to go with it. And so these photo-driven sites really tend to reflect even more of those large, colorful, and charismatic species. All of which is to say, and this is something that I just can't say often enough, particularly for a group of folks like this, there is no substitute for field work by dedicated lepidopterists. I don't care if you're professionals. I don't care if you're citizen scientists. I don't care if you're a, an interested hobbyist. Most of our good work in Maryland has been done by interested hobbyists rather than uh, professional systematists. Um, there, there's just no substitute for the kind of field work that we need to do and being able to uh, look at some of the behaviors of these species, look at some of the range extensions of these species, and look at some of the habitat requirements for some of these species. So I'm going to take a look at uh, three categories and then look at some of the, uh, um, what I consider some of the likely possibilities for coming back and looking at uh, um, that are currently uh, considered in the list. And they're going to be the likely extirpated species, that is things that used to be here historically, probably or maybe, the ones that are S1 and S2, and then the ones that I think might be in the mix when we consider this list the next time around. So the likely extirpated you'll see here on the list, and we're going to take them one by one. Assuming I can get to the right page. There we are. Dusky Azure. Um, Dusky Azure is one of uh, the most distinctive Azures, a very difficult to identify uh, genus Celestrina. Uh, many of them are hard to uh, uh, to identify from each other. This one is very distinctive. It feeds on goat's beard, which is a perennial in um, woodland uh, settings, usually around uh, forest edges and forest clearings. It turns out that dusky azure um, was, in fact, uh, a resident in the Maryland butterfly fauna until relatively recently from one known location. One known location I was up near um, Harper's Ferry, just across the river from Harper's Ferry. That was a fairly large and extensive patch of goat's beard. Uh, that goat's beard was uh, taken out by a, an asphalt road that replaced a dirt road, dirt and gravel road. Um, and with that went this only 
to our knowledge, the only population of dusky azure. So we think dusky azure is probably extirpated in Maryland. I've searched for it for several years now. There is not a lot of extensive patches of goat, goat, goat's beard. And there was a long time that we thought that this was going to be like the Appalachian azure, that they waited until goat's beard started to send up flowering shoots, and then the females would lay eggs in those flowering shoots. And so that would put them emerging sometime in June. So we were always looking for these sometime in June until we looked to see what they're doing in the rest of their uh, rest of their range, which is mostly south of us uh, in the Appalachians. And in fact, they are a relatively early spring species. And most of the pictures you see of them are of them sitting on open geranium maculatum, spotted geraniums, which bloom early May at the latest. So we were looking for them in June. They were probably flying in May. There's still a possibility that they're out there. We just haven't seen them at the right time. What happens is the males will set themselves on the dead stalks from last year's plants, wait for the females to emerge, mate with the females, and she'll lay eggs on the very small emerging um, greenery at the bottom of the plant rather than waiting to have the uh, fully formed um, uh, flower stalks and types available for, um, for laying eggs. Hessel's hair streak is another one that I think uh, we can probably say goodbye to in Maryland if it was ever here in the first place. Turns out that Hessel's hair streak is known really from only one good set of data, and that was a specimen collected um, in, in and around Mount Olive Church uh, Road in, on the eastern shore, uh, where there was and still is a considerable amount of Atlantic white cedar. <laughs> well, it turns out that that same day, that collector had spent a lot of time in Delaware collecting, where Hessel's hair streak was much more abundant and still probably persists in some of the um, some of the fastnesses of some of the Atlantic white cedar um, opportunities there. But it probably was collected in Delaware, and there are no records of it being in um, uh, in Maryland. I spent three field seasons looking for this puppy, and I think I looked at every living Atlantic white cedar tree in Maryland and planting in Maryland to no avail. And here's why I think that this is, we did not have them ever. Every place you see Hessel's hair streak now, you almost always see it in conjunction with some other kinds of little plants that are on the ground around the Atlantic white cedars where you see them. And they're not in these deep Atlantic white cedar forests where it's dark and you know there's not a lot of light. You actually find them where there is a lot of what this plant is here on the left, Calmia buxifolia, sand myrtle. And that's on the coastal populations. In the mountain populations to our south, uh, you find it on Piximoth, Pixidanthera. You need those plants to be able to support this butterfly flying in the spring. There's almost no nectar available uh, in the Atlantic white cedar um, bogs that we have and swamps that we have here. So I don't think we ever had Hessel's hair streak. And it certainly wasn't on the basis of the one specimen that we, we have had here. And there are plenty of, of juniper hair streaks, olive hair streaks that have been collected before these were named in 1954 that you could conceivably have found, but we've never seen any of them in any of the collections within Maryland. So I think we can pop, probably say not only was this actually wasn't extirpated, it probably never occurred here in the first place. Honey crescent uh, is another butterfly that you know, we thought was actually part of the Maryland fauna. And that was based on Austin Clark's uh, work done in the, in the, these collections were in the 1920s, the publication was 1930s. And here he talks about the Physiodes batesii being collected by at, around Kevin John. Turns out that's almost certainly erroneous. Um, Given what we know about this particular taxon, given what we know about its habitat requirements, given what we know about its geographic range, he almost certainly had it confused with another, um, another one of the crescents. And I'll talk a little bit about the other crescents he could have confused it with, which are not yet described. <clears throat> that that could have been an, the issue there. But I think we, again, will we'll exclude these uh, Physiodes batesii from the Maryland fauna. Don't think it ever actually occurred here. Sad. Hey, but, Rick, a yes. question. Yeah. So Austin Clark uh, had published it, you know, you see Smithsonian Institution. 
where are the specimens? If he said he had two specimens, um, is there any record of where those are? Or did they yeah. end up at the Smithsonian, I wonder? They did not. Um, we've gone through that collection looking for these, and it's really easy because of all the specimens at the Smithsonian are arranged by state. So they were able to go in and look at all the Batesiis from Maryland. There are none. There are some from Pennsylvania and some from New York. We thought they might be in the Museum of Comparative Zoology, MCZ, because he put a lot of his uh, specimens there. They're not there either. They probably have been lost. The family doesn't know where these specimens have gone either. So I think they are lost to uh, lost to science. Unfortunate, but there you have it. Regal fritillary, many of you probably go up to Fort Indian Town Gap to see the regal fritillaries. That's the closest you can get to them. Until early in the 1990s, you actually were able to find them in, uh, in Maryland. You would be able to find them um, primarily in Cecil County. Um, there was a, a, a location active up until about 1993. Right now, the nearest contemporary population is at Fort Indian Ca Indian Town Gap, and they have those open houses most years. They will have it again uh, this year, and it's a disuse or it's an active ordinance site. And the thing is, what these butterflies require is a constantly disturbed environment. Uh, <laughs> that's both for the violets that the caterpillars feed on, and then for the nectar production that they require. They're really primarily prairie specialists. So it's a very common still butterfly in many places where there are remnant prairies uh, to the west of us. But uh, again, extirpated from Maryland, almost certainly. Wow. Golden banded skipper still on the list here oh. for us. Although I think, again, this is a butterfly that hasn't been seen in the last 20 years in the state of Maryland. Uh, there had been some collections in and around uh, Great Falls. There's a historic location in Little Seneca uh, as well, and we look for it every year on the Western Montgomery count, but haven't seen that in the last 10 years of that count. It's not that uncommon elsewhere. It's particularly common in the uh, in the West, as you can see here. I knew it well in Missouri when I was collecting and working with the Heitzmans in Missouri, but you really don't see that much of uh, that much of it anywhere here nearby. Now that's despite the fact that. Uh, golden banded skipper has a very common uh, host plant, uh, caterpillar host plant, American hog peanut, that's ubiquitous throughout the southeast and a lot of Maryland. What we don't know is what are the additional requirements? Why is it winking out when there is clearly enough of the plant available for it to work with? We don't know of any other associations that would would uh, limit uh, golden banded skipper because it tends where it, where it occurs in Missouri, for example, it's a very common butterfly. You see it almost as often as uh, in some parts of Missouri and Arkansas, almost as often um, as silver spotted skipper. In fact, folks get them confused all the time. Yeah. Appalachian grizzly, oh, and I will say, I'll just go back and say every, every summer I'll get someone sending me pictures of a silver spotted skipper from the upper side. And they will say, I think this is golden banded skipper. No, they're, they're actually silver spotted skippers, sorry. Yeah. But that's true. Mm -hmm. Appalachian grizzled skipper. I'm a hopeful guy. I'm an optimistic guy. Jen and I and Tim on here and other folks, all of us have uh, spent countless hours looking for this species in the spring. Uh, it did occur in Green Ridge State Forest. In fact, it was rather common. I was on MES field trips in the in the early 80s where we saw this insect regularly um, on primarily on um, nectaring on uh, bird's foot violet as the one on the right here is. These are both taken from a site near Covington, Virginia, which is the closest site that and State, State College, the two closest sites that I know of uh, to find Appalachian grizzles. Well, we did not follow. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. No. Okay. Um, so that's the only the only local locations, and, and local is a stretch there. It could still be in Green Ridge State Forest. The problem is it is exceptionally susceptible to demise by spraying for spongy moth or gypsy moth, as we used to call it. Uh, and there was a period during the 90s when all of Green Ridge State Forest was drenched for gypsy moth protection, and it almost certainly wiped out 
Appalachian grizzled skipper complete. Could it be reintroduced there? Almost certainly. But it also happens that it, it needs the kind of habitat that you don't see there as often anymore because a lot of the glade, a lot of the, um, the shale barrens that it really requires uh, have been canopied over because of fire suppression. And that habitat doesn't exist there very often. The picture on the right, my right anyway, uh, just in back of the butterfly and in back of that stick is dwarf, dwarf sink floral. That's the host plant. It is all over most of Maryland, but it's all over Green Ridge State Forest. Um, there's something about the shale barrens habitat that is a requirement for it in addition to having that host plant available. Don't know what that is. I think, and we see this with the Olympia marble as well, there's something about those south and west facing slopes that heat up very hot early in the season uh, that allow them to emerge uh, and, and, and do some, some feeding in the early spring and then close in ways that you just don't normally find um, in moisture environments uh, throughout the rest of Maryland. Appalachian grizzled skipper though, I think the bottom line is it's also probably extirpated at this point. Chermox mulberry wing, we hardly knew ye, um, here in Maryland anyway. It really wasn't, uh, it was first collected, I think, sometime in the early 60s, 62 or so by uh, Anderson, and described by Anderson and Simmons in 1976. So it's a relatively recent uh, subspecies. It's not an actual full species in its own right. Uh, the type locality, many of you may know it, it's uh, Newbridge Road in Dorchester County, just south of uh, Blackwater uh, Refuge. The last sighting was about 2007. It feeds on a particular kind of very common sedge, Carex stricta, um, tussock sedge, just like uh, normal mulberry wing does, but it was restricted to sort of coastal habitats where you had um, sort of brackish influx, but wasn't too brackish and wasn't too, too uh, fresh. The suspicion is twofold here. One, that a lot of the habitat that we saw now gets mowed uh, every year down to the nubbins. Um, and, you know, there's just the eastern shore is, I think, uh, exists for uh, a major job creations program of mowing the sides of the roads. And that has been a real problem for many of our butterflies in on the eastern shore in particular and has hurt Chermox mulberry wing because it has eliminated both uh, the, uh, the, the host plant and it has eliminated the nectar plants that they require in the middle of the summer when this thing flies, which is uh, in mid-June. Uh, it does still hold out in Delaware, but as far as we know, again, several years worth of field surveys for this species have been fruitless and it probably no longer exists in Maryland. Pink edge sulfur, Unclear whether it actually ever existed in Maryland. I think there is one uh, observational sighting from uh, Garrett County. Fran may know that uh, better than anyone else here, but hasn't been seen for at least 20 years in Cranesville, which is where that uh, observation was. Probably doesn't exist here. In fact, when you look at the rest of the distribution here, uh, it's a fairly isolated population. Most of this is a much more boreal um, uh, butterfly in blueberry swamps in particular, far, far to our north. Model dusky wing. Model dusky wings, a hard one to identify. These are both pictures I took in, at Crex Wildlife Refuge in Wisconsin. Uh, it feeds on a plant that is a, just a terrific uh, uh, pollinator resource. New Jersey tea used to be very common in Green Ridge State Forest, used to be very common in the serpentine barrens um, up along the Pennsylvania, Maryland border in the northeast part of the state. And this butterfly was not uncommon there as well, where it fed on that. Unfortunately, uh, New Jersey tea, Cenothus, uh, is a very popular deer food. Deer browse it to the, to, you know, right down to the nubs. And it also is growing in places where people like to mow. And if there's a place besides the Eastern shore where people get really obsessed with mowing, it's in and around Green Ridge State Forest. And a lot of the nectar availability in Green Ridge is severely limited by the mowing regime 
I suspect that uh, the, the the demise of New Jersey tea, which used to be, if you know Hoop Pole Road in in the, in that area in Green Ridge, Hoop Pole Road used to be shoulder to shoulder full of New Jersey tea. If you can find three plants there now during the summer, you're doing really well. Not enough to support model dusky wing, and that's the model dusky wing. Uh, current distribution as we know it, so you know it, it sort of winked out. I think all through the middle of the uh, of where it used to be, it's now mostly uh, in si sand barrens and pine barrens in New York, and then to some extent in the um, in the uh, southern southern Appalachian spine as well, where the host plant is still relatively common. So those are the ones that I I think we need to pause for just a moment and say. Fairly well. I think we will not see them in the Maryland fauna again. Um, they are probably either they didn't occur here in the first place, and that was all erroneous or wishful thinking on our part. And some of them we still hold out hope for, but hope fades fairly quickly for species like this, where we haven't seen them for more than 20 years. And if we haven't seen them for more than 20 years, the likelihood is we probably won't see them again. Um, there are some exceptions, and there are some really interesting things that pop up from time to time but it looks like we can fairly substantially say that these are extirpated in the state of Maryland. Now, if I can move to the next category, I'll take any questions if anyone has questions about the, or can tell me that we're wrong and, and you saw one of these extirpated species just last week, that would be terrific. Um, I don't think that's the case, but let me know if you uh, have recent experience with any of these presumably extirpated species. <laughs> This is Steve Rogley in Richmond. Yeah. The, there, there was a paper in the lab journal about five years ago that showed that hog peanut was misidentified and actually feeds on a plant that's very similar to that. I can't remember the name of it though, but it's not hog peanut for the golden banded skipper. That may be true here. It's, it certainly is not true in Maryland where I've actually reared it on um, American hog peanut. But it would make a lot more sense to have uh, the eastern population, which is very, very widely scattered, uh, being on a different host plant. That would not be surprising to me at all. And there are a number of different legumes that are much, they're close related to American hog peanut, uh, but that are much more patchily distributed than hog peanut is. So that would be a very likely possibility. Um, but again, when it was, um, the population that is closest that I know of in Virginia um, that Harry Pavillon monitors, uh, it is on hog peanut there. Uh, we see it ovipositing on hog peanut. We see it uh, rearing out on hog peanut. Um, I, I know the plant well enough to be able to, to say that is in fact the case. That doesn't mean that there are other parts of the population that are using different species. And we'll see that with one of our other uh, S2 species uh, here in just a little bit. But thanks for, for that. The food plant preferences for many of our butterflies are still not terribly well known. Or we believe they're well known, but they're wrong. Uh, so there are a number of opportunities for us to do real field association studies about some of these butterflies to see if that is in fact what they're doing. You'll see this with giant swallowtail. Is it really restricted to uh, prickly ash or does it also use Telia trifoliata here, bladder nuts? I mean, that's a, that's a good question. It's a very, um, and, and could different populations have suddenly evolved a new food plant preferences uh, like the New England Baltimore checker spots feeding on plantain? Always possibilities, always possibilities. Could we have had a, a variant of golden banded skipper that was restricted to a different kind of host plant? Absolutely. Was that a different species or a different subspecies? Quite possibly. We don't know enough about them to know that. S1 species are the next level of really critically imperiled. And I, and I think about these as more of the species that you're gonna see on the extirpated list come out of the S1 species than anywhere else, obviously. The, it's sort of a, um, I would say an arbitrary decision that if you have five or fewer populations or you have a very high risk of extinction, that's a subjective thing. That's what makes for S1 species. And there are a number of S1 species of real concern to us. Most of them are hair streaks. 
uh, or elfins, but here are the ones that are not hair streaks and not elfins. And there are some successes in here, and I, I, I like to talk about the successes as much as I do the losses, obviously. But one of the successes is two-spotted skipper, which we know is uh, relatively well established in lots of uh, lots of Pennsylvania, and we've known it from a site just across the Maryland border in West Virginia for many years, but have been unable to find it uh, in Garrett County until this last season where we were in fact able to find a population in Garrett County uh, based on some field work from dedicated amateurs, just like the rest of us, um, not far, maybe 10 miles from its known location in West Virginia, um, which we always expected it would be there. And I have to say um, that there are a couple of MOS sanctuaries in Garrett County that could be hosting two-spotted skipper as well. Uh, and I would be, I'll be interested in going back and taking a look at them and some summer work uh, looking for two-spotted skipper. Bob Copper, um, we did some interesting survey work for Bob Copper. It turns out, you know, we always thought that it was mostly, this is something that sits in Cranesville Bog and we always hope to see one flying over the state line into Maryland, but they mostly sit on the West Virginia side. Turns out as a consequence of some work that Jen and I did a couple of years ago, there are a number of smaller populations of bog coppers scattered in some of the more remote bogs in Garrett County. You don't see them very often. They're very cryptic species. They have a short flight period. Um, they do require this plant here that's on the right, so this little, little dwarf cranberry that grows in only some kinds of bogs. And yet uh, we think that bog copper is doing not badly. It's hanging on rather well. But all these locations are very subject to development pressure. They're very subject to having um, their hydrology change because of nearby development or dams or other kinds of agricultural work. So it's not something that we normally think of as a very stable species, but bog copper is doing, I think as far as we know right now, doing relatively well. This is you know, the only spot that it has um, for us here. Bog copper is normally a, a butterfly, again, much more northern bogs. This is a relic species from when there were much more extensive ice sheets. But there are a number of populations, as I say, still extant in bog and fen locations um, in very small numbers, I have to say, in Garrett County. West Virginia white. When I was a graduate student in the early 80s, I would accompany Bob Denno uh, and we would go out uh, looking for these things. And you could find it everywhere from Frederick County uh, westward. And now this is its only location, uh, is extreme Garrett County, extreme Western Garrett County. Now there are a number of populations there, but it's not very common anywhere. Uh, and this is why, if you look at the plant on the right, that's a, that's a female ovipositing on garlic crests, an invasive European species. And I get the question all the time, well, why doesn't, why, why don't they know better than to lay eggs on garlic crests? Well, they didn't evolve with garlic crests. Garlic crest is more attractive to them than normal cresses because it has all the right chemical cues and more of them uh, than in fact the uh, their normal uh, host plants do. So wherever you're finding a lot of garlic crest now, you're not finding West Virginia white. There is some hope, however. Um, we've been surveying in and around um, uh, Big Run State Park and in and around Savage Forest, where there's a considerable amount of garlic crest. And yet there seem to be larger numbers of West Virginia whites beginning to either repopulate or exist in that area. How that's happening, we don't know. Have they figured out a way to not alvaposit? Have the caterpillars figured out a way to uh, break the toxic code and actually use garlic crest? Unknown, we'd like to know the answer to that. But until then, it's still an S1 species of very limited distribution. Palamedes swallowtail, one of our loveliest swallowtails, a very common Southern swallowtail, reaches its Northern distribution here uh, in the southern swamps, mostly around the Pocomoke drainage, um, particularly around Hickory Point, just outside of Pocomoke City. Um, and that's the only place that you're going to find it. They are strong flyers, so sometimes you'll see them all the way up into Baltimore. Sometimes you'll see them uh, on the other side of the, of, the, uh, of the bay, but the only place that they can survive, and you see this one little spot here, 
um, on the on the Maryland line, there was almost certainly a you know a, a flying swallowtail. I mean, they're strong flyers, and they could get blown a lot of different places. But down here in the very southern part of Maryland is the only place you're ever going to find them. And this is why, because this is the only place you find their host plant. Their host plant is red bay, swamp red bay, Persia palustris. And one of the things that makes this critter so at risk is because this critter feeds on swamp red bay that is critically endangered itself from an uh, introduced um, a uh, beetle that also carries a disease with it, where we heard that story before, and swamp red bay is dying out hugely, and probably, this is the farthest north that it's found, it will probably, unless there's a, an, unless there's a, a beneficial impact of having cold winters, we'll probably lose that as well, and if we lose swamp red bay, we lose uh, giant, we, we lose uh, uh, Palamedia swallowtail. Does that mean it's really an endangered species? It's globally secure. It's a very common butterfly. Many butterflies are uncommon at the peripheries of their uh, of their distribution, and that's to be expected. Should we take extraordinary care to make sure that they don't pass out of Maryland fauna? That's a question that I can't answer, but something that we certainly should be thinking about when we think about resources devoted to these kinds of butterflies. Here's an interesting situation, the Atlantis fritillary, never very common. I, I would say it's secure, it hasn't declined particularly. We see it every year, not in very large numbers. Um, it's a very common butterfly in north of, north of Maryland. It's a very common butterfly in the uh, upper Midwest. But Harry Pavillon just did a paper where he described a subspecies of Atlantis fritillary now called the Allegheny fritillary from the Allegheny Plateau, named after his daughter, Brittany. Um, that doesn't change its conservation status in Maryland, but the Allegheny fritillary may, because of its gene pool, may have a different conservation need or different conservation uh, issues uh, than Atlantis fritillary more broadly. And so we need to take another look at what is the conservation status for Atlantis fritillary subpopulation, Britain I. Elfins and hair streak make up the rest of the S1 species and most of the S1 species, and we'll take a little quick spin through them. I don't make a distinction in this case between uh, northern and southern oak hair streaks. We just, for conservation purposes, it means we'll treat them the same. What you see here is that we sit right in the middle of the, the desert between the northern populations the, the uh, Ontario subspecies and the Favonia subspecies in the south, the southern oak hair streak. There's little, really not much to, to just differentiate them from a conservation perspective. They probably were never very common here, and you find them irregularly in, and particularly in Virginia, you'll find the southern oak hair streak. And from time to time, you'll run across an oak hair streak uh, somewhere else in Maryland. But they're, they've never been common here, and they're probably it's probably been a long time since there's been a robust population of these creatures anywhere near us. King's hair streak, once again, highly restricted by its host plants. Its host plant is sweet leaf, Simplocus tinctoria. Uh, and this is one of those butterflies that has this really interesting distribution. This uh, sweet leaf is a very common plant in southern swamps, and it reaches its northern distribution in the southern part of Maryland. Uh, and just as you would see, the uh, King's Hair Streak has its distribution in the southern part of Maryland. But in the mountains of, of North Carolina and Georgia, um, you will see sweet leaf as a mountain plant, and you'll find King's Hair Streak on it. Um, it's probably best studied uh, in an area, and there are smaller populations across parts of the southern part of, the, of Maryland, but the locations most easily observed is the one uh, just north of Whaleyville, along the Delaware border, and that's because most of the time you see them away from any kind of nectar plant at all. And you're lucky to find them basking on open leaves around their host plant. But at this particular location, and in some points along the swamps around that area, you'll find milkweed that's growing on the borders of the ditches and along the borders of the roads, and you will find them nectaring. Like many hair streaks though, this is gonna be an issue where if you're not there early in the morning, you're not gonna see them because they only nectar early in the morning and disappear up in the canopies. If the, even when they're not 
nectaring at all and they're just sitting around in some locus if you're not there by like 9 30 10 o'clock in the morning those puppies are up in the trees before you ever get a chance to see them there's a good reason for that and it's one that's just been worked out with edward's hair streak we see edward's hair streak in patches of bare oak otherwise known as post oak uh, in early successional stages where they are heavily tended by particular kinds of ants uh, as caterpillars and and we just don't know what kind of, we had no idea what kind of pollination ecosystem was involved. You never see them on flowers or almost never see them on flowers. And that's because they don't nectar on flowers. They get most of their carbohydrates from cynipid galls. This is why they disappear so after they bask and get sun and you know, get themselves situated for the day. By about 10 o'clock, they're up in the canopy already. And this is what they're looking for, this gall on the right. They're looking for a gall exuding carbohydrates, and that's what they love to feed on. And I think this is going to be something that we're going to see is true of many of our S1 hair streaks. Many of our hair streaks in general often supplement their diet with uh, exudates from cynipid and other galls. Edwards hair streak, number of populations, we've found a number of additional populations up um, um, uh, uh, up in, in um, northern um, Maryland along the state line, in addition to the primary locations, both uh, um, in Soldier's Delight, which I think that population is now extirpated, uh, and in and around Frederick Watershed. And Kathy Barilski knows all about those locations. Uh, we, we, we track them fairly often. And it turns out that these butterflies are seemingly, again, secure, but it, you know, they're in these meadow areas inside intact forests that are often either brush hogged or allowed to grow up or otherwise uh, not uh, uh, in a position where they actively support the small growth um, that Edwards hair streak requires. I also think that there is a problem occurring with the butterfly, with the, uh, uh, again, there's a, a, uh, an ant caterpillar association. And I think that invasive ants are driving out the native ants. And that may be an even more important driver of extirpation events for things like Edwards hair streak than the availability of their host plant. Because the host plant is widely distributed. Habitat is widely distributed. But only in some places do you have, I think, the appropriate ants. And when there are invasive ants that are being introduced, that's going to be a problem. Hickory hair streak is a different story. Uh, I don't know what its situation is with respect to ant associations. It's just never been very common and it's not very common much of anywhere. There's one set of fields in New Jersey where this thing is as common as banded skippers or striped skippers, or banded hair streaks or striped hair streaks. I mean, it's just a, a, as common as gray hair streaks, but only in that one location. Um, we occasionally get them in different parts of, uh, of of Maryland, but very, 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 very seldom. It is an avid nectar. You often find it on nectar, so it's probably not one of the gall feeders, but again, a primarily northern species. Frosted elfin, I think many of you are familiar with. It feeds primarily on, um, on uh, sundial lupin, but it may also feed on baptisia, or at least some populations may feed on baptisia. It's wild indigo, and historically, you know, we actually had some populations on the western shore, but right now it's, I think, we know, we believe it's been um, completely restricted to the eastern shore, and particularly in and around the Wacomico County, um, and particularly around Furnace Town in that area. And it's more, the, the, the lupin is much more widely distributed than the elephant would suggest, so again, there must be other components, whether it's a plant, or, um, a different association with ants or something else, we just don't know what that sweet thing is that doesn't let it occur wherever else sundial lupin is. Hoary elfin, this is one I hold out a lot of hope for. We haven't seen this in 20 years. The last time it was seen was at the end of the 1990s um, and in this area here on the left uh, in, in the glades uh, in Garrett County. The thing is that wherever else we see this creature, at least primarily in New Jersey, which is the closest big populations of this puppy, it feeds on bearberry. There is new research that some of the Appalachian populations may have switched over to 
spring arbutus, one of our nice spring wildflowers, very closely related plant, if it still exists, when it, when it existed in this area in the glades, it almost certainly was feeding on something besides bearberry because bearberry doesn't exist there. So we think that is a different species that's restricted to use of, uh, of trailing arbutus. And we think that's a, a terrific thing if we can just figure out if it's still there. The location is really inaccessible. I've made two trips out to try to find that. And unless Fran can tell me differently, I haven't been able to find that uh, critter back in those glades. Early hair streak, um, probably a more common butterfly than we think. It just never comes down. You only see the, the male sometimes down on the ground uh, imbibing. And most of the time it's up in the, uh, way up in the canopies. Again, not a known nectarer, probably feeds on gall, exudates, uh, and very, very seldom uh, comes down. That doesn't mean it's a, it's a rare butterfly. It just means it's an uncommonly seen butterfly. Although it's much more commonly seen in the uh, um, in the Ap southern Appalachians than it is here. Beech is the primary caterpillar uh, association, as far as we know. Although it's certainly uh, believed to be uh, using a hazelnut species called beaked hazelnut, which occurs in our western counties as well. But the western part of the state is the only place that early hair streak has been seen. And that takes us through all the S ones. S2s, there aren't very many of them. These are again occurring in six to 20 populations, not many more than that. Um, there's a number of these here. I'm not gonna go through all of these, but I'm gonna tell you a couple of uh, real interesting success stories. Pepper and salt skipper, um, probably more common and probably relatively robust and relatively um, secure. There was a short live population at Gamble State Park just a couple of years ago, winked in, winked out. Recently, that's been found again on the Serpentine Barrens in Montgomery County, winks in, winks out. So they have this tendency to just appear, but they are really hard to see. They fly early and people just don't see them very often. So I think they're probably much more common. Kathy's seen them, I think, regularly as well. And, and I think they're much more common. I think Tim's... Uh, uh, had some sightings of these as well, and they're not that uncommon in Garrett County in the spring. Northern Metalmark, gotta gotta tell you, Maryland leads the nation in Northern Metalmark sightings. We do a summer North American Butterfly Association count every year. Uh, last year we hit 293 that we saw on that day. Uh, I think it's so secure and, and so well um, established. I think we could probably favor downgrading that to an S3 uh, in the next time we move through these. Harris's checker spot, also probably much more common than we think. Uh, lots of small populations. Fran put me on a couple of them in Garrett County one time, and there are a number up around Frostburg now as well that we know of, uh, in addition to its no normal uh, uh, location in Finzel Swamp. They're just awfully difficult to access. They're palustrine meadows for the most part that are difficult to get into. And Olympia marble, many of you have seen and, and know the travails of this one. Again, Olympia marble was nearly extirpated from Green Ridge State Forest, the only place it exists in that area, shale bear and specialists, because of gypsy moth spraying. There was one area um, we did a two-year intensive survey of the entire forest area, found one or two individuals, and then looked into a really large population. By large, I mean 20, 30, sometimes 40 individuals along a power line, where because they'd been keeping it dry, keeping it, keeping it mowed, keeping the uh, shale exposed, it held on there, and they didn't apparently spray it. Um, because it was in the middle of, of a power line and there was no trees there. Luckily, we've been able to, from, you know, using that population as a mother population, we, we would remove several females every year and, and reintroduce them into historic locations. We can now see Olympia marble almost anywhere in small numbers within the Green Ridge State Forest. And in some places, they're relatively common. Uh, I can almost certainly guarantee you that we can find specimens on Point Lookout or Picklick Road um, easily in the spring when they're in flight. Baltimore checker spot, well, 
you know, there's a, I, I noticed in Phaeton, there was this, uh, you'll have an upcoming conversation or there's an upcoming discussion around in reintroduction projects in Hartford County with Baltimore checker spot. I have to say my own feeling is that you need a full scale restoration of beaver meadow habitat in order to provide for this butterfly. I don't think you can have the kind of biodiversity in a palustrian environment without that kind of in, uh, intervention. If it's human intervention, that's one thing. But I, you know, I, I, I chuckle ruefully every year when I see all these school kids buying pot, buying pots of turtle head to plant in their garden for Baltimore checker spots. That's just not going to happen. Turtle head probably the least important piece of the of the ecology for the species. They do require it for the first two or three uh, instars, but they almost always move off, and they need a diversity of other plants for the for the caterpillars to move off on to complete their metamorphosis and complete their instars and their caterpillar stage. In addition to which, they are colonial as web feeding colonial caterpillars in their first couple of instars at the top of the plant. Deer love to eat turtle head and get a little bit of a protein with it when they just chomp that whole top of the plant off. And that's where most of our Baltimore checker spots go. There was a, a, an attempt to bring the New England species, uh, subspecies down, uh, uh, Phaeton Phaeton, which is a plantain species. Uh, it did not take off. Um, that was not a successful reintroduction here. They're different subspecies. Um, Pavillon and others have uh, characterized this as, as a, if I, um, as a Phaeton clarki, the Clark's subspecies. Silvery blue, um, probably very secure. Uh, it's, it's host plant, Carolina vetch, again, another uh, shale baron specialist. It's great. You can see wherever that vetch happens. But we can't take that for granted because there are other glaucocyches, this is other subspecies like the Xerxes blue that have gone just like that. Leonard Skipper is important because the most important population we know of is at Soldier's Delight, north of Baltimore. Over the last couple of years, we found a number of new populations in Garrett County, um, but its primary uh, habitat in Soldier's Delight, I have to say, is probably in trouble. And it's in trouble because of climate change, which has its primary, let's see, if the plant that's on the right here, Liatris, this is Spicata, I believe, um, blooms, and it's almost the only thing that's blooming in Soldier's Delight at the time that Leonard Skipper comes out in early September. If they miss that bloom, they have nothing to feed on. Liatris has been blooming earlier and earlier and earlier. The skipper has not been emerging earlier to feed on it. And I think there, there's a window now where we may lose that population. Giant swallowtail, I won't spend much uh, time with. We, it's relatively common. You see it a lot. We're seeing it more often now, not I think because it's switched to new hosts as it has in the Northeast where it's become a very common butterfly actually in New, in new England, um, relatively common butterfly, but because people are planting rue in their gardens and putting their citrus out on the patio in the summertime. And I think that's where you're getting a lot of the giant skippers or giant swallowtails, particularly in urban areas. And that takes us to S3s, which I'm not going to go through. What I'm going to do is, and you can take a look, and I'll put the link back in the chat as soon as we finish up our conversation here. I just want to skip to the very end here and talk about a couple of additions of the status unknowns. So Northern Crescent is still on the list, um, uh, and we don't know what the Northern Crescent is. We think there are two species that are involved in what we believe is Northern Crescent. They're really hard to tell apart from Pearl Crescent and you have to be looking right down into their antenna. Um, we think there is a univoltine species and we think there's a bivoltine species that's there and neither of them seems to be well described. Um, so I think that's an opportunity for us to take a look at are either of those species of conservation concern probably the univoltine species is. Compton tortoise shell, well, let me just pop down here a little, because I've got these. Here's the Northern Crescent that you have, that's, that's the view you have to have. 
you don't get that view on an naturalist. You don't get that view on e butterfly. You have to have it in hand, and you almost always have to have it in hand to be able to see the underside of the male antenna. It's the only way you can tell them apart. Compton tortoise shell, we often see um, in, uh, in Pennsylvania and farther north. We used to see it more regularly in Green Ridge. We also used to see Milbert's tortoise shell, not as regularly, but they, have, they do show up. But one wonders why Compton gets the DNR nod for uh, a species and Milbert's doesn't. Cherry gall azure was described primarily since the last big uh, attempt to list the rare and threatened and endangered species. And we don't know enough about this interesting little uh, azure that feeds primarily on the uh, galls of, uh, uh, of cherry. Um, we don't know enough about it. It's only been collected a couple of times in Garrett County, primarily at high elevations. Northern azure is another high elevation specialist. The azures, I just have to tell you, are such a taxonomic nightmare that almost nothing we know uh, is likely to be true from the last time this list was done. One of the species we might think about adding, in fact, is spring azure because it is declining rapidly because of its uh, um, uh, obligate relationship with uh, flowering dog, which, which is, itself is in trouble. Poly azure, same thing. All of these were relatively recent um, taxonomic descriptions, and we don't know enough about their range and phenology to be able to tell. And it's hard to identify them in the field. So we have to do some really hard work to try to figure out which of these may pose conservation problems, which we don't know about at this point. Bronze copper, I think, is the last one I really want to talk about here. Bronze copper occurs in two distinct kinds of uh, locations. One is as a um, coastal wetland specialist, primarily on the eastern shore, and one is as a mountain insect, a mountain butterfly, um, where it's unclear what kind of dock it feeds on. It feeds on water dock uh, on the eastern shore, <clears throat> and it has declined precipitously on the eastern shore. By contrast, we're finding more and more populations. We even found one uh, in Howard County two years ago. Um, and, and bronze copper uh, is found now in a couple of locations in Garrett County. Those, these appear to be the, the mountain or Piedmont uh, varieties. Are they the same species? Are they different species? Are they subspecies? We need to work that out. I will say that bronze copper is imperiled on the Eastern shore, primarily because of agricultural practices and mowing practices uh, along the Eastern shoreways. Quarry edge uh, declining, but probably not precipitously. We see that relatively often in Green Ridge, but that's about the only place we're seeing it. Again, it feeds on a very widely distributed um, genus, Desmodium, uh, beggar's ticks, but we don't know anything more about that. It should be much more common than we think there. And I'll just stop here and raise the question. Gem Sater. Uh, Beautiful, I think my favorite satyr, uh, is coming at us from both relatively uh, close to, to us in the south, relatively close to us in the west. It's coming to us from both locations. I think we'll probably see it in Maryland this next year. Common ringlet is approaching to us from the west. I think we'll see it within the decade. And here's the big question. If the monarch becomes an endangered species federally, what does that do for its status in Maryland, where it is not threatened, where it is very robust, where it uh, is doing just quite well? Um, something happens that we can't do anything about. Something happens on its way to Mexico and back. Um, but it's not a problem in, in Maryland where there is plenty of milkweed, plenty of other things. There's no reason for, there is nothing we can do about it. We can produce all the butterflies we want here something happens to them on their way to Mexico or on their way back from Mexico. Um, we could do more to plant fall nectar sources for them, particularly seaside goldenrod, because it's critical for them to have an easy trip south, either to the Gulf states or to Mexico, flying on coastal southerly winds in the fall, where they feed along the shoreline uh, of the Atlantic Ocean on the seaside goldenrod, which you see here on the left. So I'll stop there, take questions, conversations, let people tell me that they you know, have great uh, 
uh, new information to give me about any of these species of conservation concern. You can always go to Leplog and you'll see these uh, slides will be there and you can look at the S3 species at your leisure. If you're interested in field observations of these things, you're more than happy, more than welcome to join the Maryland um, Leps Odes group, M MD Log. It's a field group. It's a, um, a listserv that's dedicated to field observation, not gardening, um, field observation. And you can always reach me at my Gmail that's there in the bottom. I will stop sharing and come back to look at all the questions now are in, uh, now they're in the chat. Yes, Gene, I have seen early hair streaks on, not on milkweed, but on other plants. They're just not known as great, uh, as great nectars. Most of the time you see early hair streaks, it's on patches of dirt on a path in the middle of a beech forest. Floor is open. So Rick, you mentioned um, bare oak as for the hickory hair streak, right? Oh, uh, that's that's for Edward's hair streak. Edward, I'm sorry, I meant to say Edward's <clears throat> hair streak. So bare oak, um, is this, I'm just confused, synonymous with post or jack oak? It's illicifolia, Quercus illicifolia. Um, there are one of its common names is post oak, but it's not the normally or better known post oak there. Sometimes it's scrub oak, um, but uh, bare oak, I think, is its preferred common name, Quercus mm -hmm. lucifolia. Okay, yeah, lucifolia, that's good. That's what I was wondering. Thank you. Yep. Really need all of you to help us figure these things out, both census-wise and figuring out the biology of these things. And I've got a couple, I said a number of my uh, posse, we're gonna do a, uh, a spring count in Green Ridge State Forest on April 22nd, and we'll do a summer count. I think it's somewhere around the July 9th or thereabouts. Um, everyone's welcome to join us on those. You'll see details about it on Leplog, and you'll see details about it on MD Lepsodes. Happy to have you join us. We can always use more. Rick, is the um, spraying in Green Ridge, is, is that a thing of the past or is it still happening? Oh, it's still happening. We do it every year. Um, it will be- No, the spraying, the Demolin spraying. Oh, the Demolin spraying. Oh, well. So they announced now in advance where they're going to spray and give us a chance to yell at them or they have been in recent years. And it's been very, very, very restricted. Um, and they've been trying to use gyp check rather than Dimolin and, or, or a BT uh, formulation. Um, when they sprayed in the 90s, it was Dimolin. I mean, it, it just took out everything. Yeah. Um, and that was, and particularly it took out things that were open um, sort of in glade situations where you were just open to spray. I mean, if you were under canopy, it might have been a little different, but no, it was, uh, it, it took out a lot. So with the host plants being abundant there, I would think that there could be a slight chance the grizzled skipper could make some return of some kind, you would think maybe, and if, if they're not spraying. I, th I think two things, I think it would have to be reintroduced. I don't think there is a source population anywhere nearby to be able to repopulate it. I see, yeah. And I think the other issue, and, and this is something that I will give uh, the Forest Service props for, they're doing a lot of clear cutting in Green Ridge that has the happy um, uh, benefit of, of exposing some more of the uh, shale barren to open sunlight. And that's been the real issue. Much of the shale barren area there is now grown over. And people who grow trees want to grow trees and that's not been a problem for them, but they've wised up lately and have begun clearing some of that space um, in ways that has been helpful. It's been helpful for the Olympia marble. I think it would be helpful if we, I think there's probably sufficient habitat there now to support Appalachian grizzled skipper. Um, which typically is a uh, is a butterfly of woods margins. You don't normally see it uh, out in open areas. You see it in 
um, uh, in areas near forest where it goes into the forest during the day and then comes uh, during parts of the day and then comes back out and uh, and and works uh, works its magic on the dwarf sink foil um, as well looking for for um, well, they use it both for nectar availability and for uh, oviposition. But you have to go a ways. Uh, the populations in State College, I think, are bordering on winking out. Uh, the population in, near Covington, Virginia, is fairly secure, I think, at this point. Mostly because that area is being managed for um, turkey and uh, other um, recreational um, opportunities that also benefit this particular species. Kathy. Um, got a comment. Um, one of the places I found Leonard Skippers was uh, <clears throat> another place that the Ornithological Society loves, um, Old Legislative Road. Yeah. And that <laughs> is all, that was private ownership, but was allowed, you know, there was dirt biking and ATVs on it and all kinds of nastiness. That has been apparently as of early last summer, completely closed off to all use by naturalists. It's the place where many of used to go see Henslow's Sparrow. It was the Henslow Sparrow it's, spot. It's, yeah, it's, but it was it's, also pretty steady for, for Leonard's. Yeah. Yeah, Kathy, um, it's Marcia Watson speaking. My understanding yeah. is that that old legislative road property is slated to become a solar farm. Yeah, that's yeah. my understanding too. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so they think that's all good environmentally. And it could be a dual use, but it doesn't seem that the ownership is interested in naturalist mm -hmm. participation. Yeah. And interesting, oh, yeah. that population did not have um, Liatris spicata at all. They, they have uh, other plants mm -hmm. as their uh, uh, nectar source in the summertime. Yeah, often... I never, I didn't see almost any nectaring, mostly just puddling. And they're usually, they will uh, emerge a little earlier than the ones at Soldier's Delight. You can get them yeah. late, in, late in August. Yeah. That's for August. There's a question in the chat, Rick. Is there one habitat that would benefit the most butterflies that we could protect more of? <clears throat> Well, that's a hard question, Sue, obviously, but the thing that you probably recognize as we talk through these species is that many of them are restricted to a particular kind of habitat, and it's not one that they all share. So unfortunately, when you're trying to talk about conservation of rare and endangered butterflies, mostly you're thinking about how to, how to preserve this habitat or this habitat, not a whole habitat uh, of, of some kind. Now, having said that, I will say that there are some, a number of our species are restricted to shale barrens. And if we were to put efforts into restoring and preserving shale barrens, it would benefit a number of the species that are on this list. There are, there's also, I think, an, an issue of, and, and if I had talked about the great purple hair streak, which I think is, is doing just fine. I don't think it even deserves or necessitates being an S3 butterfly. I think it's actually pretty common. The problem is it used to be seen widely because it was nectaring on plants at the side of the road where you had mistletoe, which is the caterpillar host plant in the trees off the roadside. Now in, on the Eastern shore, when the road crews come through and cut everything down to the edge of the soybean field, there's no flowers at the edge of the, of the road anymore. So you don't see great purple hair streaks. They're still there. They're just off in the swamp farther where, there's, where there still is nectar for them. And so it looks like there's been a precipitous decline. So we need to factor that away from uh, away from our concerns about whether this is a species of conservation concern or not. But what that does point out is that we have an opportunity to create a lot of really good edge habitat along roadways that if we could just convince 
uh, our, and unfortunately it's just like school boards, they're done county by county and jurisdiction by jurisdiction, not by the state. Um, there's even a, a tussle in Green Ridge. Is it the county that's doing the mowing? Is it the Green Ridge folks that's doing the mowing? Who's doing the mowing? And yes, mowing could be done at different times of the year to benefit butterflies, but then how do you make sure that it's also benefiting birds? How do you make sure that it's benefiting other species? You have to do a multifactorial uh, conversation around this. I, of course, believe the butterflies deserve it more than anything else, but that's just me. There are other people who uh, who weigh in there. And, I, and I, I recount a conversation. I used to think it was very straightforward. Just stop mowing. Don't mow so far. You know, don't don't mow, you know, 10 feet out from the road. Mow two feet, maybe at all. Um, and interesting, Tim, the, the, the response that I got from wildlife managers is when you create a, an open space at of three to five to six feet at the edge of a, of a shoulder, your animal kills drop drastically because they don't go into open spaces. You don't run over as many deer, raccoon, rabbits, everything else. Now, is that a reason not to do mowing? Good question. Um, snake kills tend to be much higher when you allow a lot of vegetation right up to the road. Other reptile kills are much higher because they, they come right up to the edge and then try to cross the road. Whereas if you have a buffer of no vegetation, that tends to keep animals off the road. It's, a, it's not an easy question. That was a good um, assessment because I was wondering the same thing myself. Um, hearing this about the reptiles and other animals, uh, that's a tough one, as you said, to figure out what's the best practice. Then. Now, there, if, if you look at a, a place that does it pretty well, I think it's Skyline Drive because they they tend not to, you know, go hog wild and you know mow right up into the to the trees because they know people are there to see wildflowers as well. Um, and so I think that most of the folks on the Eastern shore don't believe that seeing wildflowers is a valued asset by the people who live on the Eastern shore or who drive to Ocean City. Um, so that's what you're, that's what you're, that's what you're dealing with there. Yeah, but down along the Blackwater Refuge and some of those places in Dorchester County, Perhaps yeah. that could be persuaded to be a reason because uh, there are people who go there for tourism purposes to observe wildlife and to visit the refuge and this, that, and the other. To me, it would seem that preserving flowers would be uh, beneficial to the to the uh, visitors and bring more people there. So. Uh, that I had a be. very upfront conversation with a roadside crew manager in Dorchester County a couple of years ago, and he put it to me very simply. He said, "When you stop that, then five people lose their jobs." And what do you say to that? I don't know. Find another job. <laughs> Find another job. Yeah. <laughs> or create create other jobs, create jobs where they're in charge of helping manage uh, critical wildlife habitat. There are other things they can do, um, but mowing is an easy, lucrative, and um, doesn't require a lot of heavy skills to learn. That's the thing. It doesn't require heavy skills. That's right. But you're right, though. I mean, the same individuals could be uh, tasked with doing other things you know, wouldn't require the mowing, but maybe management, as you said. So I don't know. It's when a question of what, what do we value? What do we value? Um, and at some point, butterflies need to be part of what we value. Biodiversity needs to be what we value. I, I don't think we want to talk about just butterflies because that gets you into this question of, well, why butterflies and not rough grouse, not deer, not this, not that, not something else. We value biodiversity. Biodiverse ecosystems help butterflies. The more biodiverse the ecosystems are, the more butterflies you will have. 
Uh, and I think that's really where we need to be here is not in what do we do for this butterfly? How do we preserve this butterfly? That's probably in the right or, not the right approach. How do we preserve biodiversity in ways that are effective for all pollinators and for most wildlife in, in, that, kind of, in that kind of sense? And I'll step off the soapbox and thank you all. No, for that's all right, actually, because the other aspect of that I've always advocated for and, and not greatly advocated, but I would say that the important thing in a lot of areas is to allow the growth of a little greenway, scrub, trees, whatever it is, just a little green between land, uh, between farmlands, between borders of properties, just let a little wild patch, because that little wild patch can sustain an awful lot of species of all kinds. So that's your answer of biodiversity preservation is you have more of that kind of thing, whereas instead the, the, a lot of practices to clear it and cut it down and you know whatever. So the, those, those little scrub patches have a tremendous amount of botany in them. And um, that's what you, you wanna sustain, to keep the rest of the critters there. If I can go back to my, you know, my beaver issue again, I mean, we, if there was another habitat that I think would benefit a large number of butterflies, it would be restoration of beaver meadows and beaver habitat and, and have them in such a way that they are connected by streamways that butterflies could fly along and be able to colonize new and emerging beaver meadow habitats. And when one of them succeeds out of uh, value, there's another new one, but you have to have a way to get there. And that's St. Francis Seder, um, which is uh, on one of the um, large uh, army bases in North Carolina, um, is there because there are still active beaver populations and because of ordnance. I mean, they they burn and they, they you know, shoot shells and that keeps this sort of new fresh beaver type meadows going. But unless you have ways for them to move from one patch of habitat to another, because of our fragmented habitats now, that just can't happen. You need those migration pathways. You need gene flow and uh, pathways for that to happen. Same way as you do for birds, except the butterflies are very seldom as mobile as birds are. Well, thank you, everyone. I appreciate uh, the, the, uh, the attention tonight and the, the really nice audience. Feel free to drop me questions. Uh, look at the rest of the presentation. You know, troll around on uh, on Leplog. I always use a lot of uh, uh, folks looking there. Let me know what you think. And happy to have you uh, um, be part of our extended butterfly community. And I hope to see you all in the field. Um, I know I'll be seeing some of you, and I hope I see more of you now that you've uh, heard the spiel tonight. Thanks, Fred. Rick, thank you. Uh, really appreciate you standing in for Jen. And of course, we wish Jen all the best in her new job up in New York. She's going to be doing similar work, uh, but up in New York, upstate New York. So um, the uh, presentation was splendid. Very nice. Uh, we appreciate that a lot, Rick. And more so, we appreciate you for all your effort and maintaining the LEP log and for your tireless efforts in advocating for butterflies and doing what you do. Um, we need uh, a lot more of that and um, people who are active and getting out in the field and doing observations. So um, thank you again for, for being here tonight and doing this for us. And we certainly will see you in the future and communicate and everything. So, um, now you're an official MES member too. Ha ha. <laughs> <laughs> and I'll be here. I'll be uh, happy to keep you guys apprised of the dates for the spring and fall count so you can put those in Phaeton. That would be great. Please do so. Yeah, we would love to do that or advertise that in there and get uh, people involved in that. And um, that would be something that uh, we would certainly like to have uh, MES involvement in in the future. So. Thanks Over for the days when we had MES field trips every spring and every fall to Green Ridge State Forest. Mm -hmm. uh, we even had our own preferred little campsite uh, down there along the uh, Sidling Hill. Yeah, yeah. 
that was uh, we did a lot of that too and um it, it was always nice we tried to vary the field trips to different locations you know um it's, it was always hard to pick a, a place that everybody would be happy with <laughs> but green ridge seemed to be a, a very popular spot because you can see a lot of things there well come and help us count uh, olympia marbles and look for appalachian grizzled skipper in april and then come help us uh, census metal marks in july that'd be great um please shoot us an email so we can um, include it in in the phaeton um mindful that the third friday of the meeting so we would need it earlier in the month to get it into the faith in a timely way. Sure enough. All right. Great so, presentation, Rick. Enjoy it. Thank you, Jean. Yes, thank you. Thanks, thank Rick. You, hey, Rick, it. I, Rick, I appreciated the call out, the shout out to the MOS sanctuaries. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm on the sanctuary committee. So is Sue Riccardi, who's on the webinar tonight, and also Jeremy Castle, who is the sanctuary committee chair. So we appreciate your uh, mention of the sanctuaries. There are a number of butterflies I'm interested in uh, checking for, and dragonflies as well. There are a couple of uh, mm -hmm. rare endangered dragonflies that almost certainly occur on some of the Garrett County sites. Yep. OK, well, um, if there aren't any other questions, then we can say good night. Um, if anybody of the MES membership, immediate membership wants to stay behind to, to chat about any business or MES stuff, we can do that.